I've been a sports fan all of my life. In fact, I've often said I cannot think of one day in my life when I haven't thought about sports and games of all descriptions. When I was a kid, uh, I used to uh, startle uh, family members by commentating on their sports games on the backyard in our house in Wellington. My brothers, uh, we didn't have any girls, we had five boys, and we were all very competitive amongst each other in sports events. I played many test matches all against my brothers and went to the Olympic Games many times all against my brothers. But I used to uh, uh, keep the records of those games in, in notebooks uh, and also um, uh, commentate on games. Sometimes uh, my brothers were playing and my mother reckons that one time when there was a famous all-black test match played at Eden Park and it was on the radio, commentated by Winston McCarthy, she reckons that after the game I went onto the back lawn and with a ball I replayed the test match by myself, being both teams and commentating at the same time, which uh, history says no one else has ever done, on this planet anyway. I suppose my interest and passion about rugby comes from... Uh, where I came from a, as a person. Uh, my father was a Canadian who came to New Zealand and was a Canadian football player and a baseball player at home. Couldn't play those uh, games here, so he played rugby and, and softball. Uh, had five boys, no girls, and so he wanted those boys, I think, to play the games that he was so enthusiastic about. And so uh, right from the start, I was, we were talking about rugby every day at home. My father died at a very young age and maybe, just maybe when I think back now, maybe in my subconscious I wanted to be like him because he was so devoted to sports and games and talked about them all the time. And what am I doing now all these years later? It's, it's, it's been my only source of employment all of my working life and I talk and think about sports and talk about it every day. When it got to the uh, upper sixth form, I was in fact a shy boy and I didn't know how to go down to broadcasting and apply for one of the cadetships which they were advertising for young people uh, to take up their first uh, opportunity to join broadcasting. Uh, so my mother went down. She went down and spoke to the uh, recruiting officer. She said she's got a boy at home who reads the papers avidly every day, who keeps the scores, who writes them down, who's keen to become a sports reporter. And they took her at her word, this quiet little Scottish-born widow, um, with determination. Uh, she put over the case for her son, and so I went down and became a cadet sports reporter. It was uh, a long time before I went on radio, and then even longer before I went on TV. So I suppose from the first day I walked in out of secondary schools was early in, in 1965. I never went on TV until midway through 1968. My first TV appearance was on a Saturday night sports results service. We raced back to the studio. You put the film in for fast processing. And when it came out, I went with the editor to cut the film and you physically cut it. And I said, the first event we'll show tonight on my debut will be the New Zealand Hill Climb Championships. Uh, and I'll write the script to match that. The next one will be the representative netball game and then the club sports we also shot. But he misheard the order. And so when I went on TV that night, my script said, well, there was some beautiful, well-oiled machinery in Wellington. And I looked at the monitor in the, in the studio and there was netball girls jumping up and down. So suddenly they were well-oiled machinery. Uh, and the words I said about these beautiful, sleek machines f fitted the netball girls. And of course, it was a, a major mistake, an error, a cock up. Uh, and so I froze and the director took away the picture, took it down to a black screen and said, Keith, just read everything to the end now. We haven't got any films because they're all out of order. And so I had to come up on screen. Now, my brother was in the lounge at home with our family uh, movie camera, the little wind-up one, and he filmed it. And you can see me uh, in terrible strife, nearly crying. I just wanted to get out of there. It was just so horrible. And it was live TV. And it's, when it's live, you can't get it back. I suppose um, the most difficult broadcast I ever had was the, the time the Springboks played in 1981 at Eden Park, the third and final test, where uh, there were outside influences in terms of uh, protest uh, about the uh, playing of that tour and the playing of that game in particular. And there was a plane flying over 
uh, there were people, uh, bombs being dropped, from flower bombs being dropped on the field of play and uh, barbed wire and, and police guards on every place. We had to go in at uh, just about daybreak uh, in the morning to, to be at the ground, to stay there all day to commentate the game. And when the plane was uh, flying in, um, hijacked plane flying in low over um, Eden Park while the test match was being played, it always came from the same direction. It came from behind the scaffolding commentary box on the uh, on the top of Eden Park, and it swooped down below my eye line as I was commentating the game. So I remember how low it got as it swept away above the goalpost and circled again. And it must have come around dozens of times during the game. And each time I could hear it coming, I had it in my mind that does this person in the plane want to really make a mark? Uh, here's a good way for them to make up to take out the grandstand. And I was sitting in the in the plumb position on the top. Or would this person think I could take out the TV commentary by wiping away that small green tarpaulin on the top of the grandstand? And that would make a world, world mark. And so I commentated the game in kind of a, a state of uh, fear. Uh, I can remember as soon as the whistle was over, grabbing all my papers and shoving them into my briefcase in just a jumble, hugging it to my chest and climbing off the tower as fast as I could because... I just wasn't prepared to be there for one second more. And in the commentary, you can hear my voice. It's very low key. It's very down in the dumps. It was, it's, it's not at all excited about the game, which turns out to be one of the most exciting games in the, in the history of the, of the sport. It was, it was just an awful uh, experience, the whole Springbok tour to broadcast. When the World Cup was played in South Africa in 1995, I can remember going over there um, and saying to some of the reporters at the pre-tournament functions, uh, yeah, we've got a good team here, but uh, have a look out for Lomu, uh, this new guy on the wing. He's just uh, 20 years of age and um, he's pretty good. Uh, but I had to say that to these people because they didn't know Jonah Lomu. He was so new. But as soon as the, the, the tournament started, he started to score tries and played this wonderful explosive rugby that, that really the world had never seen before from a winger. He was described as a, as a freak, and he was, and certainly in the way he presented himself, as a big, fast, athletic winger. Uh, so when they got to the semi-final against England, uh, he was by then the, the big name of the tournament. He had leapt into all the headlines. Uh, and I was the commentator for the broadcaster, not just to New Zealand, but to another a number of other uh, client countries. And I th was thinking beforehand, uh, what am I going to say when Lamu scores in this game? It's a big semi-final here. And so I had planned a, a little headline uh, for when he got the ball in his huge manner and scored the try. And I had pre-thought through, which is a, a good thing to do for broadcasters, a bit of visualisation beforehand of what you might say in a, in a, in a, in a critical moment. Uh, and I thought, well, here he is. I read it in the newspaper, all muscle and pump, all muscle and pump. What a snazzy way to describe the way he runs to the line. And I thought, well, he'll score a try in this game, so I'll have that ready for him. But the ball came bouncing along the back line in the very first minute of the game, and I wasn't quite ready for Lomu to pick the ball up his first touch, and ahead of them were three or four puny uh, outer English backs, and he just smashed them aside. And when I was trying to think of my line, which I had thought about in the days before the broadcast, it didn't readily come into my mind, so I was reduced to saying, ah, oh, ah, oh, as he went to score. Now, uh, if you listen to the soundtrack, you'll hear that about two or three sentences passed when he actually scored the try and I stumbled. I actually say, he plays with all muscle and pump, but of course the effect is well gone there. But when I got home from that tournament, um, you know, a month later, uh, everybody was talking about this wonderful commentary where you just captured how we all felt, Keith. You, you, we were all dumbfounded then too, and you were as the commentator. That was incredible. And people were shouting it out to me in the streets, and kids were calling out to me, getting on and off buses, and, and workmen digging ditches would call out. And you know that all these years later, uh, many, many, many years later, it's still mentioned to me just about every day of my life. In late 1998, TV New Zealand had the idea that uh, in advance of the World Cup, uh, Rugby World Cup in 1999, they would produce a showpiece series um, about the story of the All Blacks, the legends of the All Blacks. In fact, the first episode was to be a 90-minute epic, uh, which is as long as a, a movie would be on um, TV in any night. 
And uh, in the uh, start of the previous season, the 1998-99 Northern season, we travelled around the world, six of us. Uh, three producers, cameraman, sound man and myself, and we went to Australia, right through Australia filming. We went to South Africa, we went up into Europe, and we filmed uh, in, the, in the, where Dave Gallagher, the first All Black captain, had been killed in World War I. We went to the snowy uh, uh, graveyard in Belgium where he was buried. We visited all the famous names who'd been the All Blacks uh, rivals who were still alive around the world, and we put it into a wonderful series, if I may say so myself, which really told the uh, All Black story up until 1999. When I commentated uh, in the early years, I, I tried to stay uh, neutral. Um, and that got me into trouble sometimes. I can remember a famous All Black in a match in Wales uh, stomped on one of the Welsh players and cut him very badly in the face. And I was commentating and said, that, that's a foul there. That should not have happened. Uh, and that player uh, deserves to be reprimanded. I said his name openly and then carried on on the tour around uh, Britain. But when I got home, I found that I was the guy who was getting most of the criticism, not the player, because I had uh, dared to, to name a New Zealand player uh, for an action against one of those dastardly Welshmen who we don't like anyway because uh, we, we, they try to beat us. When an incident like that would happen perhaps in modern times, uh, the commentators would not, uh, uh, would not deliberately set out to be scornful and critical of that player. They might just mention that it's happened. Uh, yes, uh, Smith was involved in stomping on the head of the Welsh player there, and that's it. There's no great call for uh, the commentator to be scornful of that act. In the world of uh, business in TV today, there is uh, often an unspoken uh, understanding that the commentators will not bag uh, the game, uh, so therefore they're, they're talking much more in praise about the game because their TV company is in a deal with the New Zealand Union to promote the game together, which is a sensible and understandable business practice, but from, say, the attitude of hard-nosed journalists, it's a little bit more uh, difficult to understand. I don't want to sound too lofty about this, but when I listen to some TV commentary these days, I hear radio broadcasts from the 1950s and 60s coming through. It's very fast, it's very descriptive, there's a lot of words in it, and there's not, enough, there's not much pause, I might say not enough pause, uh, to, to let the game breathe and to tell a story about uh, somebody who's involved in the game, to make him a person, because we can all see him at home. Uh, the speed of the commentary now, because the game is quicker, um, has returned the commentary style, I believe, back to a more radio type of flow. Now, whether that's a good thing or whether it's a bad thing, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I still think there's a place to uh, lift the players uh, from being just a name and a number and a statistic and uh, try to make them uh, people.